Good morning and welcome to the Mid-Main Chamber of Commerce's Business Breakfast Series. My name is Kimberly Natto Lindloff and I'm the President and CEO of the Mid-Main Chamber. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Before we begin the program, I'd like to take a moment to thank our 2022 Business Breakfast Series sponsors. They include AT&T, Cross Insurance, O'Donnell, Lee, McCowan and Phillips, Attorneys at Law, Nicholson, Mishu and Natto, CPAs, Sheridan Construction, Morning Sentinel is our print media sponsor, our radio sponsor is 107.9 The Mix, and Kennebec Savings Bank is our video sponsor. Just a reminder that we are live streaming this today and we're also recording it. It will be edited and posted on YouTube and also rebroadcast on local access um, cable. I want to thank Choice Wealth Advisors. It's our additional breakfast sponsor for the month of November. I would remind you at this time to please turn off your cell phones in consideration of our guests and speakers. And please don't forget to complete the evaluation forms at your table. We will um, provide the feedback to our speakers and our Business Breakfast Series Committee will take it into consideration when we plan for upcoming events. We also want to re recognize our newest chamber members that were voted in in October, Six Berry Solutions, Wild Clover Cafe and Market, which I understand is opening in a week or two, um, Realty of Maine, Andy's Driving Academy, and uh, Junior Achievement of Maine. We were hope, I hope that you were able to visit the Spotlighter tables out back today. We featured Kennebec Valley Community College, Own Real Estate, and of course our entrepreneurial spotlight today was the Gats of Maine Crispco. And that was sponsored by the Harold Alphon Institute for Business Innovation and presented by the Central Maine Growth Council. Upcoming chamber events. We invite you to attend these. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, we will be right down the street at 287 Main Street in Waterville at Waterville Florist and Formal Wear. On Friday, November 18th at 3 p.m., we're going to do a dedication um, of the completion of two-way traffic at the Lockwood Hotel. So there'll be a ribbon cutting there. Um, that will definitely happen between 3 and 4 because the sun goes down at 4.08, so, but that's, <laughs> that's from 3, that's from 3 to 5. I know the Lockwood's putting out a lot of food, so hope that, um, you can join us over at Front and Main in the Lockwood Hotel. Um, I invite you to save the date for the Festival of Trees, which will be held at the Elm on 21 College Avenue on November 18th through 20th and then the 25th through 27th. We really need volunteers. We have 300 slots to fill to make this event happen. Um, it's a huge family event that's embraced by the entire Central Maine region. Everybody comes. Um, so we could really use some help. We are making it simpler this year. A lot of it's going to be digitized. And um, we hope that you can give us a shift or two. And please encourage your employees and colleagues and friends to do so too. The website is festivaloftreesmaine.com and you can volunteer you know, click on a volunteer link right there. Our November Business After Hours is the night, is the Wednesday before Festival of Trees. That's November 16th from 5.30 to 7 at Central Maine Motors Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat, which is at 300 Kennedy Memorial Drive in Waterville. Um, the next business breakfast will be right here on December 8th at 7.15. Um, Join us for an engaging presentation with Ellen Miller, Senior Vice President of Business Oper Operations for TRC Companies. She's going to present eight types of unconscious bias and introduce strategies to minimize the influence of these biases in your decision making. And you can register right at midmainchamber.com. Um, our presenters today are CEO, owner of Career Management Associates, David Julio, and Peter Lowe, lawyer at Brand and Isaacson who will speak on the new reality of hybrid working in your organization. Time for Q&A will be allotted at the conclusion of the presentation. When you are asking questions of our speaker, please wait until we get a microphone to you so that your question will be captured on our video. If not, our speakers will repeat the question. So it gives me great pleasure at this time to introduce Michelle Jolo Labby, who is the Chief Human Resource Officer at Thomas College and also our incoming board chair. And she's going to introduce today's speakers. Michelle? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce David Chulo and Peter Lowe today. Uh, David Chulo is the CEO of Career Management Associates, a New England HR consulting and services firm. 
He's also a HR thought leader, speaker, and MC, as well as uh, as well as the talk show host and owner of the HR Power Hour national radio show. David currently serves as a member of the Maine State Civil Service Appeals Board, current past president and board member of both Human Resource Association of Southern Maine and the Maine Institute for Family-Owned Business. In addition, he serves as VP on the board of Northern New England Association of Personnel Services. David graduated from Norwich University with a BS degree in business administration, a minor in management, and had four years of ROTC in the Norwich Corps of Cadets. David is also certified in creative training techniques, an Eagle Scout, and a black belt in Taekwondo. Pretty impressive, David. <laughs> Peter Lowe is a partner with the law firm of Brand and Isaacson with offices in Lewiston and Portland. Peter advises clients on labor and employment law and education law. Peter serves as employment counsel for numerous employers in Maine, including L.L. Bean and Thomas College, and some of Maine's largest cities and school districts. He also represents many nonprofits. Peter has been recognized as a best lawyer for representing management and employment law since 2013. In addition to advising clients, he regularly conducts independent outside investigations. Please join me in welcoming David and Peter. Thank you. I don't know how we're going to keep up with that great introduction. We'll do our best today. So, you know, um, we're going to be talking about remote work. How many people here are currently working 100% at work? Okay, it's about half the group. How many are 100% at home or outside of work? Okay, one. And then how many are hybrid, kind of mixed between the two? It's about the other half, okay. All right. So. Boy, has the world changed in the last couple years, right? When anybody really thought about hybrid prior to COVID? Very little, right? Maybe there was a little bit. Maybe you occasionally took a day off and worked from home for a day during a week, during a month. Maybe you did that. But boy, has the world changed. And that's changed a lot about how we think about it. Today, our job today is to talk about that. Some of the challenges, some of the advantages some of the things that you may or may not have thought about. And we're here also for you to ask some questions and answer some questions. Peter's going to give you the lawyer answer, and I'm going to give you the practical answer. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. Well, <laughs> it depends. It depends. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's our job today. So our job is to talk about it. So, you know, one of the things we thought about is the fact that how you perceive remote work has a lot to do with, let's be honest, your generation, maybe even your age. You, the way you perceive... So, I mean, by the way, generation is the polite way of talking about age. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's, the, that's the HR side of it. But. Yeah, I, you know, I have to be very polite <laughs> in the way I say things, because the words have meaning. And I just, I, I digress for a minute, but I was with my niece this weekend, and we were talking about words, and I said, well, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version, and she looked at me, she's 22. <laughs> And she said, the hawa, <laughs> of which I responded, the blog version. Yeah. And she went, I know what that is, right? It's just a totally different thought process that we have today. And that's generational, right? It is a generational thing. Peter, you were talking about it. With, we actually talked about this presentation yesterday. We gave it a good five minutes before we talked about other things. <laughs> but the truth is, we were talking about the fact that even at your law firm and other firms, we talk about the older generation is a little more concerned about people working at home. Yeah, yeah, without, without question. I mean, the practice of law would be one of those things where really you can do it anywhere, um, and you certainly can do it at home. And you know, within our firm, it's just a little microcosm. There's no question that folks at my age, and we've got a few older, believe it or not, are the ones who are most skeptical, without question. Uh, and like, really, can this be done? And I mean, I think you, you have to understand, you know, I've got partners who have practiced for 45 years and did it in the same manner always, which was you went into the office, 
you dress more formally than I'm dressing now. Uh, you interacted within the office. You, know, you probably got there you know, around a certain time and you left a certain time. And to now say to, to us and certainly a couple of my colleagues who have in mind, we're going to do it differently. You know, those, that, that, there's new people we just hired and we're going to pay a bunch of money to. You may not see them. They're like, no, you know, that, that's, that just doesn't work for us. And, you know, well, you may see them, but it's going to be on that Zoom, you know, forum. And, um, you know, th there's clearly, I have three sons who are late 20s, early 30s. And when I have a discussion with them about their perspective on it, you know, it's just radically different. And they're largely working remotely, sometimes going into an office, but they see, they just see it through a completely different lens. And they see that they are more productive, but they're not, you know, put into the, uh, what I call the cubicle land. You know, I, I work with a lot of big, big companies and I used to always go and visit them. I don't nearly as much now. And I'd see that big array of, you know, everybody in their cubicle. And you're know, saying to somebody, well, after two years where you've been able to work at home, for most of the time and the environment's different, we're going to send you back to, to that cube. And, you know, we've all read the, the sort of headline stories, the, the big techs and others who have, uh, other than Elon Musk, who doesn't seem to be too concerned about employee relations, but others who said, <laughs> you know, come back. Did you, did you see that, you know, just, it's, it's great for lawyers, but you read this stuff and you say, he fired a whole bunch of people and then he told them some of them he'd fired by mistake. You know, <laughs> uh, try, try, try dealing with that. But, but you know, the, this is, there is such a, a, you know, a different perspective, a different lens, I think, that, that so many of us have, and it may be based on how long we've worked. I guess one of the things that, that I wanted to ask you, Dave, about uh, on this, and by, by the way, questions throughout, I think, are fine. We can repeat them back or get, get a microphone. We, we're glad to do those. But... You know, from at least the experience I, I've heard from clients is that there's a, you know, there's a tension here about saying come back into the office um, when it's a very tight labor market and people have options. So there's been a feeling certainly that that leverage has been significantly over on the employee's side who said, no, if, you, if you're going to make me come back, um, I'll, I'll uh, get another job. So have you been seeing that? And what are you seeing perhaps as the economy changes, shifts, tightens? Yeah, I mean, that's true. We do have a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, em employers that have said now that COVID's over, come back to the homeland, right? Come back to the office. And we have had employees that have said uh, no, right? Flat out, no. And, and Peter will get in a minute about the legal answer of can you do, can you say no? Um, and, and so the employer is saying, please come back. And we have not had, and I do recruiting, I do HR, and I, we have not seen that we have the leverage to necessarily sometimes make them come back. They choose to leave. They choose to do something else. Oh, we've negotiated because we really, very important person. We're like, okay, let's negotiate. We do this hybrid thing. You come in for two days a week. You are home for three days a week. And on the second Tuesday or the third Tuesday of every Friday that we go in there, and we make all these deals, right? It's very confusing. And HR has their head explode because they're having all these people do different things. But yes, we've done that. Now, I, I was talking to an employer this week, and, and they said, and I quote, oh, could we just have a little recession because we need to get some power back? And, and the, there's some thought process in employers that, the recession is going to give them more, more leverage than we currently have today. And that's from a, a payroll side or price cost side because labor costs have gone dramatically up. We do compensation. Comp has gone through the roof. That would start to level out really at this point because you only can pay so much, right? I mean, there's only so much in the, the till. You, maybe you've given 5, 10, 15. We have seen 30, 40 percent increases in certain fields. And, if you're, you're dealing with very, very high-end 
engineering or medical. It's just you've had to pay it, right? But they are looking at the fact that, yeah, it's going to change. And we all, anybody who's been through a recession before, knows that the leverage does change. How many of you get thousands of resumes every day, right? Nobody. But if you remember five, six years ago, we were getting thousands of resumes every day from anywhere in the country. So, you know, there is going to be a shift, but we're not seeing it now. So, Peter, let me ask you that direct question. Can an employer mandate that somebody comes back to work? And if they do, what's the ramifications if somebody says no? Well, David, it depends. <laughs> there we go. Uh, you want more detail? Yeah, just a little, please. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this <coughs> was an issue pre-pandemic that used to come up episodically. And, you know, the, the legal issue here is, yes, overall, um, it would be, quote, a management right to say, you know, where a person works, whether it's hybrid, whether it's at home, whether it's in the office. It's a, ma a fundamental management right. What keeps us in business is there's always some exceptions. And the, the real exception is in the world of disability. And so if an employee has a disability, and a disability is both a legal and a medical term of art, under two laws, the Americans with Disabilities Act and here remain the Maine Human Rights Act. So if I have a disability, um, my, the expectation for, an, uh, for, for the employee and the employer's expectation is the person must be able to perform the essential functions of the job. And your obligation as employers is that you reasonably accommodate that person who has a disability to perform those essential functions. Lot, lots of terms that can be interpreted, but that's, that's pretty basic. So, you know, I, I, I have anxiety. Anxiety certainly as a mental health uh, diagnosed condition could be a disability. And my anxiety might be triggered by going into work. And, you know, I've had cases of, of, of this example. So I say that I would want to work at home, even though my company has said it's time for everybody to come back in. And I say, no, you know, unfortunately, that will trigger my anxiety, uh, and I can do the job from home. And therefore, I can perform the essential functions of being a lawyer, and I can do it from home, and I'm requesting the reasonable accommodation of working from home. And before the pandemic, the, 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 the big issue there was, could I perform the essential functions? And when these cases kind of worked their way through the courts, one of the arguments that employers made and made quite successfully was being together, being in the same place, being in the same meeting, being face to face, being, remember the water cooler, at the water cooler, wherever, was part was an essential part of doing that job and you know it would be fought out and judges quite frequently who may again have the generational perspective that is more at, at our point said yeah I, I i agree i agree that you know you you're part of a team and teams need to function by getting together so quite frequently the employee just used anxiety as an example was unsuccessful, saying, you know, I want to be at home and everybody else will be in the office. And so those cases often came out in favor of the employer. So we then, you know, go to March of 2020 and without, you know, any, you know, prediction, we're suddenly at home and we're figuring it out. And then we have two years of doing that. So now when I'm advising a client, I might tell them, yeah, that's how it's been viewed in the past, but I'm not so sure that those judges will reach that same conclusion or juries or whoever decides these things because we've suddenly got technology that eases many of those teamwork issues. We've got two years of experience where, you know, some would argue the sky did not fall in. The fact that certain people were not there in the office didn't, impact the success of the business, the productivity, all those things. So the, the, 
the jury is out, really, because what happens is, uh, in the legal system, things take forever. So there will be cases now that are, are, are being filed by employees who've been denied the ability to work at home. And those cases could take two, three years for the courts to issue decisions to say, was that reasonable or not? My prediction is it's going to be a tougher case, as I said, for the employers to win. So, you know, practically what, what's the advice to an employer is if you get a request to work from home and the request is tied to a medical reason, then start thinking about those disability issues. Are you entitled to get some information from a medical provider? Yes. Uh, are you entitled to then you know, make your own decision about whether it's reasonable or not? Yes. Um, but do think, in a particular case, if you're saying it's not reasonable, look back and say, well, what happened in the last two years? And, and why can't that continue? So you know, that, those, if you get yourself in that situation, and I have a handful of clients who, who are addressing it right now, and you know the issue that, that employers end up with, uh, you know, you, you'd have the same thing. Geez, you know, I've called everybody in, but Dave, who never has been the star performer, has got the sweet deal of staying at home. <laughs> and how does that impact everybody else who has to come in? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the, I mean, the crutch. I can t talk about all the cases under the sun, but that's <coughs> kind of the reality often. And how, how do you deal with that? Because the perception is he's working the system. He may or may not be. I'm, I'm not being judgmental. But he, he, that's the perception. And I, as HR or manager, well, I've got to deal with everybody else who is coming in. They're, they're paying the higher gas prices. Some of them are driving an hour, yet he's sitting there at home. And whenever we try and get hold of him, it seems like he's, uh, he's on break. So. Usually on the beach with my laptop. So <laughs> the, the, the segue to that is um, you, as the HR consultant, how do you advise a, a business about that issue? You know, the, the notion that you know, you're creating this exception, that there's a perception, whether it's true or not, there's a sweet deal. And how are you going to manage the person who, you know, frankly, isn't up there and you'd like to have some eyes on that person? <laughs> It depends. <laughs> I hope you've got the solution I, for this. I do. This gentleman had a question. I want to make sure. Yeah. Go ahead and ask. I'll repeat it. Okay. I've actually got three quick ones. Okay. Give him a mic. Yeah, <laughs> mic, yeah, yeah. mic on that. Okay. Um, one is, you know, you talked about the ADA. And when does the undue financial burden come into place on these considerations? Mm -hmm. The other is, what about workers' comp? <clears throat> considerations for people who are working at home when, they're full, when they are employees, and then contract employee definitions, and how does that work out with people working at home? I'll let Dave deal with the contract one, because that's the tricky one, which I have no clue about. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so uh, on, on the ADA, uh, exactly right. So you have to be able to perform the essential functions in order to allow someone to do that. If they're disabled, you provide reasonable which accommodations. Something is not reasonable if it imposes an undue hardship. And one of the things of an undue hardship can be an excessive amount of cost associated with that. Now, remote work is a, a little bit tricky on that because um, generally speaking, here in Maine at least, and it's different from state to state, there isn't an obligation that you, know, you fund the office at home, that you build the office at home, you provide all the, the equipment. Now, laws are likely, to, as more and more people do work from home, laws may change. And some states have imposed an obligation on employers to pay for some of those expenses. Others have required some sort of stipend. But you know, the, the undue hardship from a financial perspective of the cost of having that person there, it's probably going to be a hard case to make. Un undue hardship can also be 
a substantial disruption of your operations. So it's not purely financial. And that may be you know, the, the, the more viable basis to say, you know, if, if in fact we had six people in our small team who work you know, in design, they're all working from home, our design has gone you know, through the floor, they need to be able to work together, that's causing an undue hardship, you know, that then may be reasonable. Uh, workers' comp, yeah, it's tri so yeah, if I, if I, I'm not an expert on workers' comp, but an injury could occur at, at home, uh, I could trip and fall, it's really, I think, going to depend exactly where that happens and what I'm doing at the time. I know there's been a few cases of like people walking out to get their mail, and they say, well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm those who still get mail, uh, and, you know, what happens if they slip on the driveway? Uh, when they're going out to get their mail. And if they say, well, I was doing it because I get mail as part of my work, you know, potentially. I mean, any, any, I, I'm assuming what's happening with, with Memic and others is that they're collecting all the data on, you know, people who are working from home. Uh, your policy certainly should continue to provide coverage, um, but that's going to be an evolving issue too. And you were going to handle the contract question. Sure. What you found, though, is that if the workplace is designated at home, then an injury occurs in the workplace. It's hard for the employer to defeat that. Yeah, Dave's going to talk about cameras at work. Yeah, so it's interesting. And I'll give you an answer. Again, I'm not a workers' comp expert, but I will tell you that I have heard that there's this discussion of where you work versus if I go to the kitchen to get a sandwich. I could do that anytime for any place, anywhere. So does that include work? We'll let it up to the mimics of the world to make that decision. But you could make the argument that, that there is a confined area of work that you maybe have ergonomically approved as an employer or put situations in there to, to, to make that handle. So is it gray? Oh, heck yes. This is a very gray area, and I expect it to stay gray, as Peter said, for a number of years until all these things get worked through. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that we'll have any real answers to that full question, but it's a great question. You know, Just one thing, just one very quick yeah. comment on that. I think, actually, because what you said, the most likely comp claims are going to be people who say, my workstation contributed to my back Correct. condition. Yes. And I know, I mean, one of the people I represent is, is Bean. And Bean's had these home agent for a lo long, long time, pre-pandemic. Every single phone rep, customer service rep now for Bean works at a home. There's no, they have no call centers anymore. Everyone works at home. Thousands right now at this time of year. And, but they were going in, they, they, when they set somebody up, they were going into the home. They were sending some, one of their ergonomic people into the home for that very reason. They wanted their employees to be safe, but they also you know, didn't want people, you know, a year later saying, you know, I worked and my back is shot. Yeah. So th th there, are, there are those things to, to figure I, out. I think that's probably one of the tips that we could give you today. If you don't, if you currently have people working from home in a hybrid environment or even permanently at home, is to know what their environment is they're working in and either sending somebody or using a camera or some sort of effort to get that because it may save you on the workers' comp side as well as protect the employee and yourselves from undue potential surprises, which you may or may not know about. The question came up about, obviously, how do we advise clients about dealing with these situations? I'm going to break it down to quick, two, quickly two things. One, the disability side. We've always dealt with disability. Have we not? It's always been, and, and I, I smile every time somebody says somebody gets a sweet deal. Well, there's been plenty of times, pre-working at home, that we had to agree for somebody to work less or do something less because of the disability, and we couldn't tell everybody else what the problem was because it's a protection of their personal information, and we can't share that information. And I know I have been around a while. Peter's been around longer. But I've been around a while, and in those conversations, we always said, well, why does Bobby always get to dump up? And, and, and there was this whole conversation and in HR. We'd be like, well, because that's the decision we've made, and we really can't share any more information about that, right? That's kind of in, in a crust. That's what we said, because we can't share it. This is no different. 
And so I, I think one of the things that happens when you're talking about disability or, or things like that, you're not going to be able to necessarily tell them why. You're going to have to have the same conversations of these are conversations we can't really have. This is the decision we've had to make for reasons that we cannot talk. Uh, but I would also say that it's also about authenticity and being as authentically honest as you can be up to the line that you're allowed to be. And that's the same thing for, you know, we have manufacturing clients and we're advising a manufacturing client now on hybrid. Now, just think about that for a minute. Right now, it's very difficult to put a CNC machine in the middle of your living room, have the product brought in, work on it, then pick it up from the house, move it to the next house, put it in that machine, right? So that's not realistic. But the administration people want to work potentially from home. They want to, why can't they? They're in finance or they're in other areas. And so there becomes the haves and the have-nots, or the perception of have-have-nots. That's the decision the owner has to make. That's the discussion they have to have. And they have to have a conversation with the, the leaders and the management to bring together to decide what's best in the interest of retaining talent, keeping talent, and looking at that from, from that perspective. So it's really not new. Right? This is not really new. It's just a different way of thinking about it. And to that end, I'll bring up this one point, because we're going to talk about culture next. I have a question for Peter which I'm sure he'll say is a thorny question, which means he doesn't know the answer, but it's fine. Culture is how you define it. There was a Peter, myself, Hannah, one of his partner, and Ashley, one of uh, my, my second in command VP, we were all on a, on, a, on a Zoom conversation having a discussion about a client. And we were talking about how culture is a perceived culture is changing because people are working from home and you can see them from here up. And there's this perception of how are we going to get them to be engaged when they're away, right? And how many people think that that's a question? How do we keep them engaged, right, when they're away? And so Peter, myself, and Hannah were having this, well, actually, Peter, and myself were having this conversation about well, how are we going to do that. And I noticed that Ashley was very quiet in this conversation. So I, being the good boss, said, Ashley, what do you think? And she goes, well, it's how you define culture. I'm fully engaged, and I work from home. 28 out of 30 days a month, and I'm more engaged with the company than ever. So I don't know what you're talking about. The culture's fine. And there was this moment of which I went, it is. And so we, we both went, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's us, <laughs> right? It's, it's us. Our, it's our unconscious bias it's that our, you'll be dealing with that next, you'll do it next time. <laughs> because next we have month. this perception that culture is you have to be there. But it isn't necessarily. And it is a reprogramming of our mind a little bit, especially if we're over the ages of 35, 40. Or even if we have an old soul and we're in our 30s, right? Because I know some 30-year-olds that act 60 and some 60-year-olds that act 20, right? It's what we think, and it's our mind shift to make that happen. So having said that, Peter, let me ask you this question. When we're dealing with culture and, you know, we're going to be saying, hey, maybe we have cameras that we turn on and we have, you know, let's, let's all get together and have the cameras on and let's talk during the day. I have a client that right now is every workstation has the cameras on during the workday all the time. They always have this screen on. Everybody's up in the field. They're a small organization. They have 15 people. They have 15 squares on their page and they're always going as if they're in the office. Hmm. Now, they've all agreed to that. There's nobody that disagrees with it. It's a very young company, not a surprise. I'm sure they're used to doing you know, FaceTime. Anybody have young children? My, my grandnieces and nephews all call me, and if you've noticed, all, all this younger generation, they have to see you on FaceTime, right? They don't just, you know, millennials texted, now they have to see you. But my nieces all throw the camera on the bed and it shakes to the ceiling, and they <laughs> talk around, and they're like, I'm like, are you there? She goes, yep, right here. Right? It's a different mindset. I, I go, that's strange, but okay. Yeah? So how do you deal with that when Big Brother potentially is watching everything you do? Mm. Is that okay? Well, what it triggers for me, and I'm not going to answer his question. There's nothing unusual about that. But I, I kind of get to it. But okay, uh, I'm sure you will. One of, one of the really interesting things, and I, we both had the same experience, and I'm sure some of you, you know, those of you who work in HR had the same. So for a couple of years, 18 months, two years, you know, all the issues we were dealing with, of course, were the pandemic. And we were advising on things that we had never imagined. Like vaccinations, can you, can't you, should you, 
face covering, you know, all those things that, that we all spent so much time. And all of a sudden, and it was refreshing, it's like, ah, the old stuff came back. And I don't, I mean, harassment. <laughs> and and yeah. It, yeah, yeah, it's, it's put my kids through college. <laughs> <you know. laughs> I, I, I'm actually serious about that. It's like, people behaving badly has put my kids through college. So it could put them through master's programs too, because it does not end. It's not as if, True. you know, it, we had the, you know, the Me Too and all of the, the attention and training, and, all, and I'm not making lightly of it, but there's something about human nature that you can give some people all the guidance, all the direction, and I'm, I'm, I have scores of those cases. And you're like, have things improved? Yes. Thankfully, they have improved. But is that still occurring? Yes. And, and I think some of you who are in HR are probably saying, yeah, we're still seeing it. So I go to the place like with the cameras on is, oh, my God, we've got some new you know, type of harassment case now. Or, or we're going to you know, have potentially issues that, that arise that way. And we were just talking at the table before, a little, little experience. Uh, it wasn't harassment, but it just shows the perils of, of, of cameras and technology. By the way, it is so good to be in person. And I, I maybe I'm going to reveal my biases, but I can tell more about you, know, you your level of engagement, what your interest is, uh, rather than staring into that Zoom box. So... I am going to be someone who's still going to say, yes, getting together will make us more effective as an organization. Not the whole time, but to me, this is a little example of that. And when I've pre presented for those last two years, and I could see myself, or heaven forbid I could see Dave, it's like, I don't know what they're doing. Well, I did, in fact, find out what one gentleman was doing, because we had three cameras one time. It was, a, it was actually a school board presentation. So there I was course, talking incessantly. Hannah, who's my colleague, trying to get a word in edgeways. Good luck to her. And then this other gentleman. For some reason, his camera was on and everybody else was off. And I'm so busy talking that, you know, I didn't notice, but Kat, Hannah came into my office and asked me, oh my God, did you see her? What? He took his laptop into the bathroom. We re now, there was nothing overly graphic, I can assure you, but we replayed it and then told the people to edit it. And you could see he's like putting it onto the sink and it's like not bouncing and then you can hear a flush. It's like, <laughs> all right, so there are some perils that, you know, with, with, with the camera on. Joking aside, and, it, and we can sort of touch on this, the whole notion of surveillance, videos, recording, um, it gets us into a totally new legal field. And it's one, there are, we'll get to this in a minute, but there are state laws on these issues. And for those of you who then have an employee who's actually in New Hampshire or has gone to Florida and is working in Florida, or you, hire, you can't find an engineer and you end up, I found one in Nevada, uh, she doesn't want to move, but we can accommodate that. You then open up yourselves to you know, all the different state laws. And there are some really strict state laws on recording, when you can record, uh, surveillance, eavesdropping. And, you know, I'm not gonna, it's, today is not the time to get into it. So yeah, when you say, uh, yeah, the cameras are on, and you know, I don't know whether it's being recorded or not, there becomes a whole new area that us lawyers, that like, Get, get, get some red flags about. From a, how do you view it, though, from a cultural point of view? How, how is that? Well, you uh, know, this was a great example of I, I, don't, I don't recommend it, right? It's, it's, I, it's not something that I would go and say as a consultant, yeah, I'd do this. But, you know, I certainly have seen collaboration of groups get on for a couple hours, and right, you, you do a Zoom meet and you do all that. And, and just to your point, they're not recording. This is just live, live feed. But they all think it's wonderful. And, and so, again, 
is it not individual organizations that make these decisions? And that's the beauty of it, right? Now, certainly there's a lot of risk and, and they, they seem to know that. It's a fixed spot, it's only at their desk area. They kind of have figured that out, but who are we to judge that? That's a cultural decision. And again, a younger demographic and they're used to it. They're used to the camera being on all the time. And, and I, I, it's, it's yeah. just an interesting thought in terms I share it because it's just out of the norm. But they love it, and culturally, they think it's great. Well, I, I don't think you answered one of my earlier questions. I'm going to come I'm back. Try not to. <laughs> uh, the, so I'm back to the person who gets to work from home, accommodation, yeah. and they're just... They're, they're not a star. Uh, the they're, they're, they're the one who, you know, the rest of the team knows is not a star. You know is not a star. You've, in fact, kind of kicked the can down the road on performance management. You know, you, you it's not, <laughs> someone said no. It never happens, does it? Yeah. I, the, the, my favorite, some of you have heard this, but, you know, so frequently, seems like employers want to terminate people on Fridays. I don't know why. They call me out Friday afternoon. <laughs> And they say, Peter, we, we've got to let, I'm going to pick on you, David, go. Yeah. So, okay, fine. You know, you know they just want me to say fine. Yeah, cool. Check with legal. It's good. How long has he worked there? Oh, 35 years. Uh, uh, but he's this, that, and the other, and the other, and the other. And so, so we're, we're, what's his performance reviews like? Well, we stopped doing them a few years ago. Either that or, well, uh, yeah, they're okay. And I, if I get them, they're like stellar. You know, all right, you're going to let this go. guy go. He's been here 35 years. You told me all these things, but you know, there's not a shred of paper that has it. Anyway, putting that aside, so obviously doing your performance reviews has some, some real value for those Friday afternoon conversations so that I can give you the green light. Mm -hmm. but, but what do you do? So, you know, again, maybe I'm going to betray my bias. I, I think that when I see, see somebody in the office, I've got the eyes on. I can tell how engaged they are. I can tell if they're picking up work for others, or whether they're going the extra mile. You know, some of the things I've just been used to for 30 years. Now I have somebody, and I don't know what they're doing. Uh, they're not replying to my emails on a very prompt basis. Um, how do you advise the, the employer? How do, how do you performance manage that? What, is it different, or you just do what you should be doing as performance management? Two answers. One, yes, you should be doing what you should be doing so Peter can let them go on Fridays. Okay, let's just start with that basic premise. But, you know, performance management has changed a lot. Anybody still do annual reviews only? Okay, right? Does anybody not do any reviews at all? Does anybody wish they didn't do any reviews at all? <laughs> just, ask, just asking the question. The truth is that nobody ever liked yearly performance reviews. Nobody ever has. We have the halo and horn effect that the, you know, three months or two months prior to the review, they do something great. We give them the halo. They're amazing. We, they do something terrible three months prior. They get the horns. They get a less. And if I ask anybody what they did 11 months ago, you'd go, I have no idea unless it was some amazing thing. So we don't do a good job of them to start with. We never really have. There's some organizations that do them pretty well, but most don't. What has changed in the conversation about remote is the fact that we're really basing it upon project work. Most people are, that are doing remote were saying, did you achieve X, Y, Z? What were the goals ahead of you when we do it? We're going to see you once, twice a week. God help me, it should be more. But let's, let's say we talk twice a week on Zoom because we've got many people. You've got 70, 80, hundreds of thousands of people at Bean. Do they talk to everybody every day? Of course not, right? And supervisors may not talk to them every day. So it's about how that conversation has become. And we talk about being a conversation once a month now or quarterly at least to be providing feedback to them on the basis. And you only know if you ask questions, right? You only know if you have a dialogue. It's the only way you can do it. And it really changes those, instead of a compliance mentality, you have to switch to a collaboration mentality. And that, if you are going to manage as a compliance manager, Sherm just came out with an article yesterday, anybody knows what Sherm is, Society of Human Management. That just came out yesterday with a big article about 
management and leadership that is being effective remote. And it's all about not compliance. Does it matter if they answered the phone immediately in terms of to your call or if they called you back in 10 minutes? Maybe, maybe not. What is the expectation you set from the beginning? Were you as a leader, actually somebody says, it bothers me if you don't call me back immediately. I mean, if I call Peter and I have a, a legal issue, at least three or four days he calls me back. If I, don't, I, if I don't answer in 10 minutes, I get a text. <laughs> Yeah, and then, and then and I text him and he gives me an answer. And that's, that's on Saturday morning as well. It's true. And I do that. And then he charges me for seven hours. It's fine. It's fine. There is a premium on weekends. <laughs> but, you know, as a leader, it is still about, and nothing's changed really. It's about what your expectations you've set are. It really is how you set up. I'm gonna, you're going to be able to work from home. Great. Congratulations. That's awesome. Now, here's how we're going to figure out this relationship, and we're going to have a dialogue. Here's what I expect from it. And then you have to hold them accountable. The number one problem I see as a leadership coach from executive coaching is people always are very easy to list all the things they want. And then they never hold them accountable or do the performance management later because they're afraid to, they'll quit, especially in the environment today. They're, they're essential. Oh my gosh, that's where I see the disconnect. So the answer to the question is, yes, you've got to do it. The performance management has to be done all the time now. And by the way, nobody, even older generations, liked having once a year we talk about what we did. Nobody did. Right? The truth is, if you have that dialogue on a monthly or quarterly basis, and here's the last step, and then I'll let, I have a, a legal question for Peter. Four questions, simple review. It can be done in 15 minutes. What's, go what's going really well? What challenges are you facing? That's number two question. Third question is, what can we do for you? What do you need for training development and so forth and so on? And then what are the goals that you're going to agree to? What are you going to do for us? Four questions, 15 minutes, your review is done. That information then gets compiled, put together every month, every quarter. It's done. It's smart. And you've addressed the issues up front. And then you can call Peter and deal with it in terms of that. Well, let me ask you this question because yep. do you scrap the annual review? Some companies have, but some companies have made it that it's a continuous review. Some companies have taken the 11 months of those conversations, and you already actually have a real review at that point. It all depends on how you do compensation yeah. as well. Yes, in terms of that. And we have another question. The mic over there. Come on, you're on TV, smile. Yeah, I am. I have uh, one comment. Compliance management is kind of an indirect threat in some companies. But my real question is this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the difference of working at home for full-time employees and contract employees? Sure. The difference is there. Sure. So I'll talk about contract employees. And I'll give the general answer, and then there may be a legal follow-up in terms of this. We all know that contract employees... Um, there's a definition of what a contract, independent contractor is. And there's certainly been some, some updates to that in terms of what the federal government is requiring for it. The reality is you can't tell a contractor how to do everything or how to do what it is you're asked. You can give them a guideline, but they have to be able to do it their way. That's one part of the equation. Second of all, they have to have other companies or organizations they work for. Right? So you can't do that. If you are telling them how to do it, if you're doing everything for their employee, that's a very simplistic answer. But, but that's the truth. So when you're dealing with contractors, you, you are going to treat them like you would a vendor or another company. You're, you're giving them what the guidelines are. You're following up with what their expectation is. It's usually project-based. and They must achieve something at the end of that. You can certainly, if their behavior or performance is unsatisfactory, you let them go as a contractor. It's much easier. It's a contract, right? You get to end the contract on that. It's not an employee based. Can you review contracts? Yes. But you can certainly use the same criteria, only a little bit different. Peter, you want to add to that a little? Yeah. Well, well sometimes words do count. So never call them a contract employee because immediately the Department of Labor say, ha, see? They're an employee. <laughs> you use that term. So, um, the, the, this is one of those areas where the, the law kind of shifts back and forth. 
depending on, on the, the administration, who's, who's in correct. charge in Washington, because it's largely, it's a federal question, it's also a state question. But, so the pendulum is shifting right now, and it's moving somewhat to, to make it more difficult to be an independent contractor, general statement. I'm like you, I try and make this simple. And, and you'll see, you'll, you know, consultants, lawyers will be sending all this stuff out, this test is changing. I often say, it, that person, if they didn't work, provide services for you, would they have a business? What would they be doing? And if the answer is they, they don't, then you own them. They're your, they're your employee. If, oh, they would be doing or they are doing this for others, I think that's a good test to say, yeah, that, that person is, in fact, a contractor or a vendor. I've simplified like 20 factors into one. But I think that's, that's just the, the, the most basic way to look at it. Um, did you, yeah, you kind of answered the question I, I posed you. I think one thing we should turn to now um, is you know, some of those issues. Now, well, well, this would be helpful. How many of you have employees who work out of state? Just a couple right now. Uh, do you, some of you see that as a possibility? Would you? Would you cast the net further, or if someone asked to work out of state, would you let them work out of state? The answer is predominantly yes. No, it's <laughs> a bad. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so, but, so what we're seeing, um, certainly in certain in certain industries where it's been incredibly hard to find talent, that positions are becoming you know remote and out of state positions. Given that it's a it's a pretty small number. You know, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but the minute you know you do have somebody working in New Hampshire, by way of example, uh, all of a sudden that person is in fact subject to all the New Hampshire laws, even even though you have one. And then you know, all there's a lot of there's a lot of compliance and complexity once you have somebody working out of state. But you know what we've seen. Um, it's, it's working in two ways in that you know, people can now say, well, I'm going to stay in Maine. I want to stay in Maine. I love, staying, I love working in Maine, but I'm going to work for somebody uh, in, in California. And in fact, my partner worked for Martins Point Healthcare for years, and she always wanted to work for a bike company. Saw an ad from Specialized Bikes in, in California, a recruiting job in HR, applied and is working for them now, but exclusively um, from Maine. So you're seeing talent that you know, would have worked previously for main organizations, having the opportunity to work elsewhere. So it's going to go both ways. So I think, I, I think we're going to see more of it um, for, for all the reasons we've seen. And then, you know, so, some organizations are having to tackle, you know, all of the, it's not just the employment law, but the, the, the tax issues that go with it, all the different leave issues, a whole, you know, a, array of things. And so, I will tell you that, over the last year, even two, clients that would have never considered that are hiring from out of state and setting that up and they're remote working now. They, they would have never done that two, three years ago. And, and that is now a big deal. And suddenly, you know, your handbook is including seven states, eight states, nine states, 20 states in terms of making that happen. So it is. Yes, we have a question in the, in the front. Uh, oh, Mike's coming right behind you there. What about the uh, workcation, I guess, uh, where someone wants to go to another state or to mm. another country for three weeks and they're going to work during the day and, you know, be a tourist? Mm -hmm. um, that's a, awesome. so in, in, my, in my lexicon of, you know, that's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, we're seeing that. I had one recently yep. where somebody, actually, yeah, it was a, it was a main company, um, but they wanted to go to the U.S. Virgin Islands for, I think it's that six months, so more power to them. But uh, do they need somebody to go with them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I offered to go and meet with local council down there, <laughs> get a feel. But the, 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 the practical answer, again, believe it or not, I do get practical, despite what Dave says, um, that, that if it's a very short period of time, it's really unlikely that you're going to fall afoul of, some law or regulation, and certainly within the United States. Um,
But once you get to months, like three months, then depending on the location, there are some potential that you get into some tax issues uh, and some other, other things that will create problems potentially for your organization as having a presence there and then whether you should be withholding, you know, whether, you know, so you, the longer it goes, weeks versus months, because back to the question about workers' comp, so, you know, what happens when somebody, you know, is in the U.S. Virgin Islands and then they have an accident working, you know, it, it becomes a bunch of those, those compliance issues. We have, you know, some clients who, um, again, these very much, you know, home-based positions that you can do the job from home where they're wanting to keep people who are becoming snowbirds and who, is, who are saying, I, it's time for me to move to Florida, but if I can still work 20 hours a week, it would be great, but can I do so from Florida? So we, we were asked to do an analysis because some people were thinking about Florida, others were thinking about Texas, and others were thinking about California. And not surprisingly, we said, don't allow it in California, ever, 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 ever. Um, Florida, yes, you know, the, there's, there's relatively little complexity. Um, so it, it can be very state-specific. State Texas, kind of in the middle it was, in fact. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 I think it is something, it is definitely something you'll see, see more. I, you know, I know, again, from my own family, that experience of my son sometimes working in California, sometimes working on the East Coast, sometimes in Colorado. He's been doing his job in, the, in that way. And he would say the skiing, the surfing are all great, and uh, I can work in between. But uh, we have another question. Our CFO and I are talking about compensation and what's that worth to somebody who is allowed to telework versus another person who isn't allowed to? Well, that's a great question. Well, you're the comp I, expert. So, so I will tell you, we do a lot of comp work, and, and this is, matter of fact, this is the busiest year we've ever had in compensation, as you can imagine, with all the, the changes that are happening. But um, the question of, is that worth a premium, or is that worth a ding, right? Something to take off it. And I will tell you that what we're really seeing is based on the job more than somebody being somewhere. What's the worth of the individual more than the worth of where somebody is? And so the truth is, is that we end up paying comp of what the person's of value to the organization, not to if they're in Florida or if they're somewhere else. Now, we do have to look at the fact it is a factor if you live in New York City, cost of living is different and you may have to compensate them and consider that for their cost of living as a factor. That is absolutely a piece of it. But if they're an engineer, we use that as a great example because they are one of the high premium jobs at the moment. You can look at that as a factor. I have not seen a single company, and we have done, oh, I don't know, 50, 60 comps this year, talk about dinging anybody for being somewhere else in that area. They've been either raised or lowered based on compensation of where they live sometimes, but not dinged for it, not and, at all. And, and I would, you know, I can see an issue where some, back to my reasonable accommodation, I'm working at home, and the person says, uh, I should be treated like everybody else, and I'm being paid less, and the only reason I have to work at home is because I have a disability. So you can see the seeds of a discrimination. The other way you can see, I, I think we'll see issues down the road, is where, again, my person who works at home because of a reasonable accommodation says, yeah, they let me work from home, and you know, they kind of had to, but they never embraced it, right. and I never got promoted. And in fact, you know, I wasn't getting the attention that three other members of my team were because they were in the office, and they were the superstars, and they got all the support, and they got the plum projects, and that's going to happen. Clearly, that's going to happen. And yes, there will be a reality that if three people are in and one's not on a team, those three are going to spend more time together. I mean, I see it. Again, in my own, where, where I work was four or five of us in regularly, and I'll suddenly have some work and I'll assign it to that person who's right there. <laughs> you know, I don't have to like, set up a Zoom call. I don't have to email back and forth. Hey, Hannah, uh, by the way, could you just take a look at this? You know, that's how you know, work flow has traditionally happened. So 
I definitely see issues, in, and that's something to be mindful of, that the person who is at home and is home as an accommodation doesn't think, hey, I've been sent to Siberia. You know, they're, they're doing this very reluctantly, half-heartedly. Well, that um, can also cause a problem of morale, right? So if we're in a situation where we can't get talent, find talent, retain talent, and somebody is really good and they're at home, why should you treat them differently? You know, from, from an equity standpoint, why should you? And uh, do you really want that out there? You know, we talk a lot about the glass door effect. Anybody know what glass door is? It's a site online where people write about you and your employee as a manager and so forth. And we call it the glass door effect. People go to there to check out about you. I remember I talked to my niece who was graduating and she said, I said, so where are you going to go work? And she goes, well, I'm interviewing with two companies. I went to glass door to look at it. And I smile and I go, Honey, let's talk about that because you know it's all going to be negative on this. She said, yes, I'm fully aware it's all negative, but here's how I look at it. If there's 10 things about the same thing about that person from 10 different people over a period of time, it's probably true. If it's just griping on a whole bunch of different things about the company, well, that's just people griping. It's pretty smart thinking. That's how I pick a restaurant. Same thing. That's how I pick an attorney. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> If, if you haven't told, Peter and I are good friends. And we have so many clients together. His, his rate is going up, <laughs> by the way. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how that's possible. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> we have some fun. Uh, so I hope that answers your question in terms of it. Oh, one follow-up, yes. Follow-up. Um, and and I, un I understand what you're saying um, because we're looking at that, too, that there are some, p based on their position, that the worth of the, the individual, we, we want to retain that person. But then we have, we need people to show up in, you know, at the workplace to do certain jobs. And um, there's the situational situations where there's the generational divide because the steady eddies are there who don't have small children at home, but the daycare factor is getting worse and worse it's mm -hmm. not like we're, we've always had flexibility for people in all seasons of their life um you know when things happen at home but um daycare now is just people are having to work from home more and no, more it's, it's very true we're seeing a lot of that daycare elder care just care in general if anybody's having to deal with trying to find home care for a senior it's just as big a problem as, as daycare. So, but should they be penalized for that, right? Is the question that always come up, the answer is no. They really shouldn't because do you want that to be your reputation? You know, reputation management is very important as a culture and also about retention, right? So I was, you know, I was paid less because I have to do this. So I was not in the in crowd because I couldn't come into work. That's not gonna serve you well in the long term for retention. We're gonna take one more question as we get ready to wrap up here. Sure. It's probably more of a statement, but it might get a comment from you. It strikes me that it's extremely important in the interview process to be hiring somebody who is a self-starter as opposed to somebody who has to be directed if you're going to be having people working in a remote situation. Uh, because you have people who, they'll do their job if there's somebody looking over their shoulder. Um, but if there's not somebody looking over their shoulder they, they, and they're easily distracted, they might think they've worked all day long, but they spent half of their time uh, drifting and staring at, out the window and, and not fully aware of it. You're describing me with the, the two days I worked at home. <laughs> I'm hopeless at home. I, I, I'll admit it. Frankly, I like wander around, get distracted, get off talk. I, I like to work two days in the whole pandemic at home. I had the benefit of going to an office by myself. And I need that. I, I recognize that front and center, but, but, it, but it's different all around. But yeah, as the HR person... Yeah, you know, I'll, just, I'll simply say that hiring is always important of the questions. If you're still using the same questions, the, the question used in 1980 and 1990, that's a problem. <laughs> you got to rethink the way you hire. We're out of time. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank oh, you thank so you much. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. So thank you, David and Peter. That was wonderful. Um, I want to remind you to please take a moment to fill out the um, evaluation forms on your table. You can either leave them face down on your table or drop them at the table, um, the registration, as you exit. We have some door prizes this morning, um, and I'm just going to do it. 
Um, the first door prize is a $10 gift certificate and a tra travel mug donated by Aroma Joe's, and that's going to Don Plord of Coldwell Banker Plord Real Estate. Oh, did he leave? Nope, he doesn't get it then. We've been down this road before. It's actually going to Sabrina Jandro from Central Maine Growth Council. She lives at Aroma Joe's, so this is this is a yes, it is. Our next is a fifty-dollar um, valued um, Kennebec Valley Community College swag bag, and it's donated by one of our business spotlighters today, um, Kennebec Valley Community College, that has a team here, and that's going to Roger Krause with Kennebec Water District. Our next drawing is for a $15 Holy Cannoli gift card donated, donated by Tri-State Staffing, and that's here. And that's going to Chris Avery from Kennebec Savings Bank. Uh, Kim Hawks is here from Own Real Estate. Um, she's also donated a $25 um, swag bag. It's not really a bag. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, 50. Um, do, it's a collection of local items donated by Kim from Own Real Estate, and that's going to Lori Lefferts from Skills, Inc. We have a $10 Sella Tea gift card donated by Sella Tea Cafe, and that's going to Sarah Waddick from One River CPAs. We have a $25 gift certificate to Perks Auto Repair donated by Mike Perkins, and that is was going to Dave, Dan Eckert, but he left, so he's not getting it. Um, and that's going to Rob Natto from Jimbro. Is Rob here? Rob Bounce, too. Okay, see what happens when you leave early, people? Uh, Ryan Poulin from New Dimensions Federal Credit Union. Do we have the T-Mobile donation? No, because he had five times this morning. Okay. Um, we have a, the last one is a $10 gift card to Governor's Restaurant, donated by Governor's Restaurant, and that is going to President Karen Normandin of Kennebec Valley Community College. Is she still here? Yeah. She had to leave. <laughs> Dwight Littlefield. Dwight's here. If you're ever interested in being a business spotlighter, please let one of uh, the chamber staff know because we'd love to um, have you get a table. Um, also want to remind you about the crackers out back. Please, please take a box before you leave. We also do something called Chamber Chatter. They're Facebook videos. They are not Facebook Live. We tape them. Um, when I say we, I mean Chad. Chad tapes them, edits them, and we put those up on Tuesdays. They're free to chamber members. So if you ever want to do a Chamber Chatter, they're like five to seven minute videos, pretty short. Um, just let us know and we'll get you lined up for that. Um, so this concludes this morning's forum. Thank you for coming and drive safely. We hope to see you in December.